So get people in the room and know your supply chain. How cool. Jake and Roddy, you want to come to the stage? We've got another chair that's being set. We're going to do a final panel where I'm going to ask folks to just summarize what they've heard and try to bring it home. And I talked that Mickey and I work together at AMR. Mickey is very attuned to sourcing and risk management. Uh, Jake led the talent panel, and you did a very fine job, Jake. And uh, Roddy Orton and I have worked together for many years in our demand-driven journey. But before I go there, I want to just thank the team from Supply Chain Insights. Jill just left the room. <laughs> But uh, Heather, who is in the back of the room, does my quantitative research. And if you have any feedback about the research surveys, about the research that we're doing, please let us know. And Abby Mayer, who does all the financial benchmarking, if we can help you with the performance and the graphs that you saw at the beginning of the conference, we'd love to help you there as well. And you'll be getting a follow-up survey about the conference that we'd love to have your feedback on. And all of the video that we've done at the conference will be archived on Monday. And all of the PowerPoints, with the exception of one, will be available on our website. We really want to encourage people to share. So let's think back. We started with our traveler. And we started with the fact that 9 out of 10 supply chains are stuck on the effective frontier. And we really tried to take the concepts of supply chain and make them broader and talk about what we could do at muscle and interior and innovation at the edge. Jake, as you leave here, what kind of things do you think people should think about in, let's say, one year, three years, five years to bring it home? What spoke to you? Uh, so, Laura, first, thanks for uh, organizing the format and bringing people together. Because, it, you. you know, unfortunately, with the business challenges that everyone faces, you've got to begin thinking differently if you're going to continue to be successful. Um, in a context of like a one, three, and five year, I think, you know, strangely, you could have spent the last day and a half and, and gone through the sessions and said, you know, those are some neat, nice to know components without ever actually seeing that they had a common stream. So I think one of the elements that you could do in the near term is realize that you can combat a couple of the outages by linking together topics that were reviewed. So mm -hmm. one year. Everyone in the audience is facing a ticking time clock and it's all the different stages on talent. Outages. Can't even run the base operation yet they haven't perhaps thought about how I can replace how the work was previously done by leveraging some of the analytics that can sit on top from a big data standpoint and not require me to fill those roles anymore. I actually shorten the data latency to actually take advantage of knowing where the outages are so I can proactively and preemptively prevent disruptions in the supply chain where the majority of the foot soldiers spend their time. So on a one-year basis, I think simply the, the, the courage to step out and say, I don't need necessarily to go through another three, five, seven-year big architecture, enterprise-wide implementation. I can plug and play a few things to actually go help me solve problems right now. Three years. I think you've got to build some additional muscle. We talked about the skill base and the, the challenges. The frequency of the business challenges is accelerating, not decelerating. The talent ramifications of what the people need to be able to do is increasing, not decreasing. So you're going to need to look for creative solutions of either, you know, and I'll bring it back to some of Jeremy's ideas yesterday. There are clusters of expertise that if you don't have the ability to do a piece of work, you can very quickly crowdsource it, bring it in, and actually have it done exceptionally well in the near term. And without missing a beat. On a five-year basis, I think you're, you're really, you're at the point of where some firms simply have to bite the bullet and understand they need to undergo a massive transformation. Organization design, process design, how they're executing the work, how they use partners, what partners they're using, how they're even thinking about where they're going to be, what their product lineups are going to be, and they need to start it now. But it's going to be a five-year journey for them to be able to do that. 
Ronnie, your thoughts? One year, three years, five years? How do you start? So <clears throat> I think uh, I really like your innovation at the edge and, and agility at the center as muscle. Um, so I think one of the challenges, if, if one listens to the succinctness of Rick's story this morning, right, it was profound in its simplicity. And one of the, one of the comments I made to him was, you know, maybe we all had to go through a 360 degree journey to figure out what we were trying to say at the beginning. And, and now when you listen to it being played back, you hear the element, the key elements, which having worked with P&G and, and, and others, you, one recognizes. So one year, I don't think that the mental model of supply chains in most companies has changed yet. And, and what, what I mean by the mental model, it's, it's, it's that change that you saw with Kimberly Clark going through the journey. It's the change you saw in P&G with the first moment of truth. So that is absolutely the priority, is to get the leadership team to start working on changing the mental model of the organization. Now, let's go to the three-year part, because th that, by the way, that mental model starts to impact uh, how we organize, how we recruit, um, what what priorities we have in the business. Three years out. I love the fact that a few leading companies, and it, and it always seems to be the same companies, have identified this idea of a digital value chain, a digital value network. So you would say, what's with the digital? Why don't we just call this an integration of IT? No, it's a fundamentally different approach to the way we think about information. And so companies, and, and again, I'm, I have to, use, you know, everybody knows me as Mr. P&G, and I'm, I'm probably never going to change. But if you watch P&G's um, last 12 years of journey that I was privileged to kind of have insight into, and along the way, there were individuals who were mapping out the business processes as part of an enterprise architecture program. And probably the most sophisticated uh, approach to architecture that I've seen because it was issues based versus trying to model the whole world. So what's with the three years? We have to now start thinking and preparing for a digitally enabled value network that is much more than just integrating data and systems and applications because that in a sense has held many companies back into functional excellence silos. Right, so three years out, digital value network. And by the way, the operationalizing of innovation. What does that innovation at the edge actually mean? Because it's not something separate, it's part of that digital value network. Five years, a, five years out, it's actually bringing that to light with big data. So innovation become insights and you've heard the discussion about big data and it's come up in the topics i think the point is that um, the pro profound thought about big data uh, i picked up in a sort of a, an obscure foreign affairs journal and and the person writing the article said you know we've always had the paradigm that we take lots of transactional data we put it uh, into you know, repositories like data warehouses, and we mine it for answers to questions we think the business has. And because we mine it out of data warehouses with tools that grew up in that you know, era of data warehousing and analytics, the focus has been master data. Well, five years out, we're going to have more data than what we can handle. The real challenge is, can we take that data even if it's only 90% accurate, and find the questions that we don't. No, forget about trying to answer the questions. Let's find the questions we should be asking and then start exploring for the answers. So that is the capability we need to have developed in five years because as we move to, in PNG parlance, the second moment of truth, which is real demand shaping based on real market insights, we better make sure that muscle you talk about in the agility is now able to, and we heard that sort of in this digital manufacturing piece a little earlier, 
better make sure that that muscle is geared to be able to work that new agility because it's going to be a different level of agility to what we're used to. So one year mental model, three years digital value chain, val digital value network, five years the agility of the end-to-end -end system and real insights being operationalized. Mickey, how about your perspective? So what I thought was interesting is when you started this conference, you talked about the fact that there's been silos in the supply chain and the roles and the functions and it's looked at as function and it's really, you know, the, the model isn't over here right now, but it was really about where is the innovation going to come from? What are we going to be when we grow up? How do we get to that next level and how do we go to that outside in thinking? And the first step for me I, that I think I would like everyone to take away is start thinking outside in. It's not that hard to do. And conferences like this, which challenge you from a whole mental realm across all different aspects, can actually take you there. And I think that's the one thing that you need to take away from this, outside in. That would be the first year. And I'd start thinking about, I look at these other companies. I understand what they're doing. What can we learn from them? And how do I understand to take some of that thinking, look at where we're at, and start to build a plan? So it's understanding with our senior leadership, where do we want to go? And what does that plan look like to get there? When I look three years out, I want that plan to be executed and we're making some progress. The problem is a lot of the resource issues, and you did a great job in this talent section, we're missing the right people. We don't have the talent we need. We don't know where it's going to go. We have some great ideas of all the big data and how we're going to start looking at things differently and to Roddy's point about the questions you need to be asking. But what does that mean on the type of resources you're going to need? You have an idea a few years out, which gets you into three years, but what changes in five years? And then if I step back and I think about that five-year standpoint, what happens when we have even more issues around climate? and we have nodes that go out in Japan and another node that goes out in Europe and we can't get around the polar bears. What happens when we miss another element of risk we never thought about? So when I look at it from a one and three and five year perspective, I think we need to look at it as a growth path to say we've got all these resources we have right here. We need to think about that outside in, learn from each other and take some of that you know, sometimes we call it benchmarking, sometimes we call it learnings from others and best practices or whatnot. But take those nuggets, have those conversations. That's where this, this type of conference allows you to have those discussions. And understand what you can take back. Take that back into your organization and start to lay out where you think that those changes are going to occur, knowing that they're moving targets. And you may have to move those around to ensure you're going to have that outcome in the long term. You know, Laura, I, just to build on those, the, the thing that I find just amazing is that people continue to try and crack the nut using the same mathematical formula. So they, they, they literally run the formula and they say, well, I should be able to get a different outcome now. And so to, to take those, changing the boundaries of how you're thinking about what data I'm pulling, how I'm drawing the lines around the network, redefines how the formula works. You actually start getting different insights and different things you can change. I mean, I, I, I used the example yesterday, but I really believe we have some people who really haven't woken up to the fact that their business model three years from now will not be functional if they don't begin changing it now. Well, let's talk about organizational. So in our research, we find that over 50% of companies have a supply chain center of excellence. Only 33% feel that it's really effective, right? And we now have a chief supply chain officer at the table in many organizations. And we have different kinds of training that's available. But how do we rethink the organization to take all this input, right, whether it's Jeremiah and the collaborative economy, or what's happening with uh, additive manufacturing, or big data. You know, we find that about 33% of the companies have a big data group, or mobility, or Internet of Things. Jake, what are your thoughts around organizationally? How do we go about really seizing those opportunities? You know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that in order to go drive change, you have to have some change agents, right? At the end of the day, you have to have some people that can actually orchestrate the path and make sure that the pieces are coming together. 
you know, you, you make the reference lore around, um, you know, the COE approach or whatever. You know, in, in what I've seen in many companies as I've gone out, what they've done is they've tasked them with executional stuff, which I think is completely the wrong approach. In fact, it's great if you give them, I'll make it up, they're responsible for doing all of your supply planning across your universe. But you also have to charge them with the change element. So you must deliver process excellence across our capacity or our supply planning network. But you must also equally deliver us the next step breakthrough in cash, in cost, in productivity. It changes the whole mental model of how they, do, they think about the organization, how they think about the work, how they think about attacking and understanding what's about to happen to us, weather, non-weather, whatever, change in business model, change in channels. It, it forces them out of today. So I, I personally believe this whole aspect of driving the change has to be orchestrated, but it must be using a different paradigm. And so you think we confuse the urgent with the important in that? Or? I, I think um, in, in true lean methodologies, you know, when you're, when, you're, when you're a true prophet of believing in continuous improvement, you must make sure that people are thinking the whole system versus a task. Otherwise, they'll take lean out the window. They'll go eliminate a step that might have made you two days more efficient getting to market because someone was looking at it in isolation. So yes, they follow it out the window. Ronnie? Yes, yeah, so I, I have a very strong feeling about uh, the fact that organization evolves as a journey based on your maturity. And I think that that's not well understood. What do I mean by as a journey? So many of you have probably heard me present my this five-stage maturity model that uh, I've been using in continuous improvement, et cetera. And, and just to, to refresh your mind, and there's no rocket science to this. One, you react to problems. Two, you build projects led by specialists around issues, whether it's demand, forecast, accuracy, inventory. Three, you're organized for functional excellence. Four, you operate as an end-to-end -end network. And five, you operate as an end-to-end value network focused on value. Now, the problem is, and, and interestingly enough, over all the years working with P&G and others, I actually saw those stages of the organization evolving. Now, companies often get stuck, and they often get stuck for the wrong reasons. So, if my sole reason for existence is to put one instance of, you name it, an ERP system in place, and I drive my organization with that one instance of ERP, how good and how well do you think you're going to transform to a, because that's an inside out order to cash point of view, how do you think you're going to transform to a outside in demand driven point of view, right? Because suddenly you've entrenched your organization with a big system, you've entrenched your processes with a big system, and it's damn hard after spending billions of dollars to move to an end to end information flow, which is why I say in three years, companies had better start figuring out what that digital value chain strategy looks like, because that's what it's all about. And that drives the organization. Mickey, organizationally, what would you do? When I step back and look at this, I think there's a broader perspective here, and I think Roddy just hit on it. And that is, it's not just about a supply chain, it's about a value chain. And Laura started off, you started off the conference with, end-to-end, -end, um, customers, customers, to supplier, supplier. So what is that value chain and what does it look like? If I think about Roddy's statement around the digital side of it. So how do you connect, if you can call it networks, you can call it whatever you want, but all those pieces of that value chain, what does that look like? One, what's the business process? Two, yes, we've talked about efficiency and efficiency get you, get you so far, but what is the efficiency side of it? Then throw efficiency to the side and say, What's the effectiveness? What are we actually doing? How are we getting that product to the final end point where it needs to be? What does that look like? And how, as a value chain, if something were to go awry, do we move a lever to actually fill that back in there? And how do we ensure that all of us are going to be successful, and how do we get there? So I almost think it's, it's standing back and it's mapping it out, 
but it's understanding the levers that need to be played and who are the value chain partners that are going to help you bring that to the forefront. You know, Laura, I'll give you a, a pragmatic example. You know, I had the, the great honor of working with some brilliant people in uh, P&G before I left. And I, I still to this day remember A.G. Lafley and Keith Harrison, who was our former chief supply chain officer. We were together and A.G. posed this question because as he was going after the two moments of truth, he said, well, the, obviously that means I really want you guys to engineer how the supply chains work and I want you to use it off of consumer data in the marketplace. And he, and he made this statement. How hard can it be for us to run the operation off of point of sale data? I mean, it sounds like a, a really rational question, right? And, and we got into this big discussion about what it was going to take. And, and I remember we had, at one point in the discussion, we had to literally go into kind of a literal interpretation. Okay, AG, it's sitting all on the floor. We have it. We can't do anything with it. We've got to reorganize the organization. We've got to reorganize the way we have the plant and the processes, all the planning, all the procurement. We've got to change all of that. And to this day, iterations of that have occurred, but it's still, as Roddy mentioned, you're on a journey to really still be able to do that in a much more finite and near real-time way. So let me add a piece to, uh, to what Jake said. I'm gonna pick up on what Rick said this morning. When I think uh, you may have asked him, so what was the step that you took towards the end-to-end -end supply chain? And he said something quite profound. He said, and boy, is this a simple thought. He actually takes supply chain people and put them in customer-facing roles. Duh. How many organizations have done that? Right, so you can't, you, you get stuck in stage three, which is functional excellence, because the supply chain is a function and the supply chain is seen as, you know, box kickers and, and label stickers. But at the end of the day, unless you take the supply chain and you make them part of the customer, consumer, buying process, and then figure out how to translate the capabilities back into the business, you're going to get stuck in stage three. Yeah. Anything you want to leave the audience with, Nikki? First off, I want to thank you. Um, this is a, a great conference, and I, I think we all should give Laura a big hand in the team. The thing I want, to th I want to leave you with is this. There are a lot of different aspects that can make or break our supply chain that was brought forward in the last day and a half. And a lot of your discussions you've had in networking and whatnot. The point is, what are you going to do when you go home? Is it just back to work as usual? Are you going to take something outside in that you learned today? And I guess I'm going to challenge you with this. One month from now, each of you send Laura a note and tell her what you've done to change something and the impact it has. And then follow that through a year from now. That would be wonderful. I'd love to share those. I'd love that. Roddy? So I'm going to echo you know, the applause for you for, let's say, bringing a conference back that has meaningful content. So I think kudos to you for, for taking that challenge on. And I think. Uh, we all have a role to play to support law in that. So my, my recommendation, and I'm going to pick up on a point that, uh, that Mickey made, and, and I'm going to relate to a story. And it was kind of a profound wake-up call when, when years back, probably in the mid-2000s, I heard P&G say this. And that is, how do you think outside in? What does that really mean? So I remember the P&G team once saying, when you have a stock out, Go stand at the shelf and walk back down the road that the product followed all the way to, and figure out what went wrong. That's outside in thinking. Mm -hmm. And guess what? There's many things you can do to prevent a stock out. But when you go and stand at the shelf and you walk back into the supply system, you're going to figure out why it happened and then go fix it. And that's what outside in thinking is all about. So make that trip. Make that trip. Walk the chain. Um, I think for me it's, uh, simp it's just a simple concept. Uh, too many of perhaps your supply chain leaders believe they have to be perfect. And we deal, our jobs, our livelihood is all about imperfection. Okay? It's about making the impossible possible as I described it yesterday about shortening the initiative lead times or 
translating the, the reaction times in production equipments or processes or sourcing or whatever. And, and I think there gets to be this protection zone where you're not really challenging the organizations in the, I mean, let's, let's be very pra practical about this. It is tough as hell to get up in the morning and be a supply chain professional these days. I mean, when is the last time someone didn't ask you to lower cost, lower cash, uh, shorten the cycle and the reaction times, bring something to market faster than has ever been delivered in the history of your operation, and it's become an everyday thing. And it's all, and, 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 and it's, it's not I, all. And, and by the way, it's not a trade-off. I need all those things because I need you to pay for the launches, the expansion, the capital improvements, all of that. And I think you, you have to realize that when you're, you're forced in talent shortages, you're, you're, you've got outages, you have people working their butts off in transactional things, that sometimes lifting above and having them go after the breakthrough and celebrating failures of falling short when they've gone for a breakthrough. I always described it as, what is the worst thing that can happen when we go for a big, hairy objective? We actually come out much further than we did if we were looking for incremental gain. And I think we're at a tipping point, Laura. So that's the piece I'm really, the point I'm trying to make. We're at a tipping point. If it, you believe you can go home and continue to operate the same way I think you're fooling yourself. You, you, there are so many environmental, macroeconomic, and everything else that are playing and swirling that you must think differently. You've got to use your res what resources you do have differently. You have to start reorganizing now, not waiting. You're just not going to get a let up. A simple, can I just add a comment to this? A simple truism we used to use at South African breweries, or SAB Miller today. You can't do the same things. Or if you do the same things, you get the same result. If you want something different, guess what? You have to do a few things differently. And that's the point. Our goal at this conference was to have you leave here thinking differently. As you think about your travel and the processes and technologies that got us here for the last 30 years, now is the time for us to think about what could be different and how we better serve value-based outcomes. We hope to see you back next year, and we look forward to sharing all the content with you and your teams. Have a safe trip. Thank you.